This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Who exactly is Chase Oliver and what does he really stand for? Just Asking Questions. Oliver is the Libertarian Party's 2024 presidential nominee, selected after six rounds of voting at a contentious party convention in Washington, D.C. this past weekend, which featured speeches from RFK Jr., Vivek Ramaswamy, and Donald J. Trump, who suggested himself as the nominee to a chorus of booze. Oliver was not the preferred candidate of the Mises Caucus that's in control of the Libertarian Party, and several of their high-profile members, such as Dave Smith, has said they will not vote for him, with many accusing him of being too woke, too pro-immigration, and too soft on COVID restrictions in the past. We'll ask him to address all of that and more today. Oliver is a 38-year-old sales executive who rose to prominence in the party uh, in the uh, as the 2022 Libertarian Senate candidate, in a highly competitive race in Georgia, where he pulled 2% of the vote and forced it to a runoff, which ultimately resulted in the Democrats winning and tipping the balance of the Senate in their favor. Chase, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thank you for having me. I look forward to speaking to Reason. And uh, of course, it's been a very busy day here in Washington, D.C. I've got to speak to lots of voters who are really excited about hearing somebody who's not Donald Trump or Joe Biden running for president. Fantastic. Well, you know, you as the 2024 Libertarian Party candidate, uh, you're going to kind of be an introduction to libertarianism for many people who've had minimal exposure to it. Maybe the first time they've even heard of a libertarian um, or talked to one. If you're out there talking to people in person, what is the message in a minute or less that you want to get out to these voters? Yeah, well, it's the for me, it's not the first time that I've had to do this. I ran for the Congress in the city of Atlanta for the first time that a libertarian was ever on the ballot there. So I got to introduce this concept to many people. And my elevator pitch is pretty simple. If you're living your life in peace without force, fraud, coercion, theft, or violence, your life is your life, your body is your body, your business is your business, and your property is your property. It's not mine, and it certainly is the government's. And the Libertarian Party which is the third largest third party alternative for voters who don't like Republicans or Democrats. Um, Also this year, RFK Jr.'s independent candidacy will be a factor since he'll draw in some of the protest vote. What is your plan to cobble together a coalition and win over some of these disaffected voters? What are some of the issues you'll be emphasizing? Well, it's about targeting the most likely voters that we can bring into the camp. When uh, we ask libertarians across the country uh, to tell us when they first became a libertarian, no matter what age they are today, the most common answer was between the ages of 18 and 29. That tells me we need to reach out to the next generation of those who can come into the Libertarian Party. And if we're going to do that, we're going to speak to the issues they care about. There are college kids on campuses all across the country who are asking for a peace candidate, say, for a ceasefire in Gaza. I am such can- uh, one such candidate. There are kids all over this country, young people rather, who see the cost of living increasing. They go to the grocery store every two weeks for the same amount of money, and they see the uh, less and less filling up that cart. And so we have to speak to the inflationary problems that we have that are devaluing our dollar. Because when those kids are raising kids, rather, uh, you know, we're going to have real issues where we have a massive inflationary policies, uh, huge mounting debts and deficits. And of course, the warfare state all over the world that destabilizes and shifts opinions away from the United States favorability because we're exporting our values with bullets and bombs and not through markets, voluntary cooperation and, uh, and, and freedom. I mean, well, to what degree is that actually the case right now? I mean, a lot of people would counter and say America is actually exercising a fair amount of foreign policy restraint right now. What do you make well, of that? I, I, uh, I don't believe anything that we've had since 9-11 could call it foreign policy restraint. We have still continue to have our troops on the ground all over the world. We continue to invest, uh, inject ourselves into politics all over the world. And it's up to us to do that via diplomacy and actually free trade and not use that via militarism, opening bases, pushing our soldiers or our, or our military intervention via foreign aid onto other nations. We need to have a more peace-based foreign policy that's rooted in diplomacy. People begged for that when Obama ran in 2008. He said, I'll meet anyone without precondition. And that won him a lot of votes. And then he abandoned those principles. I'm telling people, I'm the real deal. I will actually seek to use diplomacy as a tool before I use the warfare state uh, as it exists. I noticed that you call it the genocide in Gaza. Is that accurate? Uh, 
if we see as many people being carpet bombed as we see, uh, it seems to be that it is on its way to removing an entire population from the area. They keep shoving people further and further into Rafa, into uh, southward. And the Israeli government has said multiple times, we would love for these people just to leave and never come back. And that's what they're trying to do is shove these populations out of where they have been. And we actually need to see uh, better solutions there that aren't rooted in carpet bombing people, killing like, tens of thousands of innocents. I understand October 7th was a horrible thing that should never have happened. And Israel would have a right to respond. And if they had done so in a way that was like a scalpel and not like a sledgehammer, we would have much more support for what they're doing. But too many innocent people have died and we must see a ceasefire today. But that's a little bit different than saying that we believe that the Israeli military ought to um, you know, end their offensive in Rafa and use a different strategy. Genocide is very different than critiquing the actions of a military. What constitutes a genocide? Generally, when genocides are happening, uh, you know, the military that's conducting the genocide isn't warning people, warning civilians to leave the places they're sheltering in advance of that. Right. If you listen, if you listen to the rhetoric from the worst of the far right and elements of the Netanyahu government, you will hear genocidal rhetoric out there. And I say I support those in Israel who are actual voices for peace, who understand that these actions that we are taking will destabilize the region, make it more likely to go war with our Arab neighbors and make it less safe to be the average Israeli out there. So I'm going to support the voices of peace within Israel and ask that their government respond to those voices instead of continuing this militarized policy, which is killing far too many Gazans. We must see peace. Um, I'm going to take us to a little bit of the internal controversy within the Libertarian Party, because I was there at the convention. There are some deep divisions between various factions, and the faction that opposed you is does not seem happy with your nomination. I uh, brought up this tweet earlier from Dave Smith who says that this weekend we retained control of the LNC while re-electing Angela McCardle, who's a phenomenal chair, and put on the best convention in the party's history. Unfortunately, we lost the big one. That would be the presidential nomination. Uh, and there's no getting around that. Yesterday, I congratulated Chase in person and on here. Of course, I can't endorse or vote him just as he wouldn't for me. He doesn't represent me and my camp or the things we stand for. What do you make of Dave's reaction here, which uh, kind of speaks for a, a group within the Libertarian Party? And is there anything that you feel you can do to build a bridge back to them? Well, there are two things I want to say. Dave kind of spoke for, you from, spoke for me in that tweet. The truth is, is if Dave Smith had run for president and been nominated, I would absolutely endorse him and be voting for him to secure ballot access for the Libertarian Party in Georgia. We need to have a presidential candidate and get over a certain amount, or we lose that in my home state. And there are other states like that. I would be supporting the party and supporting the candidate if you were the endorsed candidate. I would have been endorsing Michael Rechtenwald because I want to secure ballot access. I would have been doing that. And I was ready and prepared. If, mine not, if the VP candidate, I did not prefer one, I would have walked on stage, shook his hand and said, hey, we may not agree on everything, but we're going to have to figure out how to work together for the party. I'm glad that I got an amazing running mate in Mike Termott, who's ready to be a full-fledged partner for Liberty in this case. And I'm ready to keep working for that. Now, two years ago, we also had a contentious convention in Reno, Nevada. And I was on the losing side of nearly every one of those votes. But guess what? I stayed involved. I didn't quit. I didn't leave. I committed myself to the principles of liberty. And I understood deep down, no matter who our candidate in 2024 is, they'll be less uh, likely to create wars than Joe Biden or Donald Trump will support reducing government more than Joe Biden, Donald Trump, or RFK or any other candidate. So I would hope that personal differences or or, or hurt feelings because their side did not win in this debate, does not draw them away from liberty. I'm extending my hand telling people, do not run from this party. Stay committed to our principles. We will disagree on some things. And if you don't want to, if you don't want to talk about those things, that's fine. Let's talk about the things we do agree on. Ending wars, ending the taxation that affects each and every one of our pockets, getting the crisis of immigration solved through less government, not more overly intrusive government. There's a lot of areas where there's division. But what I'm willing to do is sit down in the room and talk with people, extend my hand, just like I did in Reno and at every convention I've ever been to, whether I've been on the winning side or the losing side. Liberty is too important for personality. We have to get out there and support one another and the principles that we are fighting for as a party. And I will continue to do that as a lifetime member of the Libertarian Party. And I encourage others who may be upset after a, an understandably long convention day. We all were in the hall all day long. Feelings and tensions were high. Take a breath. Go home, spend some time with your family, and realize that our principles are more important than a few policy disagreements. Deep down, we are all libertarians. Is the Mises Caucus messaging bad for the party? You know, uh, it's not the messaging I would put out there. Uh, we can look at the, the success of that messaging in terms of membership or donors or elected libertarians. And I would say that if you look at it on a pure metric, 
we need to change our marketing up to be a more positive based marketing that brings new people into the tent that doesn't seek to divide libertarians amongst themselves at all, but rather open up the gate wide for new people to come in, discover liberty and grow our party from the grassroots, because that's how all change begins is at the grassroots. And I encourage the decentralization of politics. Many of the things that the Mises caucus has espoused, things like localization, uh, nullification by challenging the federal government at the local level. These are things that we can agree on. And I encourage anybody who's a Mises caucus member to understand that if we can run a positive campaign that can inspire people to get in the tent, we can make those changes at the local level together. But how, but how do libertarians escape this PR problem, right? Because we have, um, you know, Twitter accounts with the words libertarian party in them, retweeting anti-Semitic cartoons uh, and, you know, some really awful stuff. I'm just thinking about what's happened in the last few weeks. I mean, where do we go from here? I think many people, non-libertarians, have been asking me, like, Liz, what is this? What's happening with the Libertarian Party? Like, how do you feel? Your your wagon is necessarily hitched to that label. Yeah, so I speak to the uh, the need for professionalization for organizations. Some of those things are made mistakes or are actually completely wrong to have done because those people don't understand how to market themselves and market our principles. And frankly, those people shouldn't be in charge of Twitter keys if they're uh, sending out anti-Semitic and horrible uh, things. Bigotry is not good, man. That's collectivism. And if that's the dividing area between some of these members, between hatred and not hatred, accepting people for who they are and anti-Semitism, well, I'm sorry. In that case, if that's your principles that you're standing on that are causing you to walk away from me, then fine. You do need to pound sand in that case because I don't have room for hatred for people based on their religion or where they come up or how they are. If they live their life differently than me, if they do it in peace, I have no reason. I, you know, I go by the, the, the philosophy of love thy neighbor. I was raised... Christian. I'm a proud Christian. And I believe that love and empathy are way better building blocks for uh, building coalitions, partnerships, and getting things done than hatred and, and division and, and, and signaling people that are horrible or you're bad and I'm good. That kind of division is two-party nonsense. And frankly, if I may say so, it's a little bit of bullshit. I, I want to bring up some of the specific uh, criticisms that uh, the, the, the surfaced in the backlash to your nomination. Just because there's been a lot of stuff floating around about what your positions are or are not, I saw that you actually had to correct a uh, the isidewith.com website, which uh, is one of the popular websites that uh, lists what a candidate's positions are. Um, so I want to bring up a few uh, of the uh, notions about your views and have you clarify what it is you stand for. Uh, I just picked this tweet by a user named Amuse because it kind of boils it down to a lot of what I've heard. Um, he says, libertarians, by nominating Chase Oliver, the LP just alienated every Silicon Valley libertarian I know. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, their presidential nominee supports transitioning children, mask and vax mandates, men and women's sports, and open borders, uh, and then it has you uh, at, looks like maybe a gay pride parade holding a rainbow flag that says, don't tread on me, um, which I, I'm not sure that there's anything wrong with that picture unless you have a problem with gay people. But uh, let's start with transitioning children. Um, uh, what is your stance on puberty blockers, surgeries, so forth for children? So in terms of healthcare, I want to keep healthcare out of government's hands. I support parents making decisions for their kids. I'm not in support of trans and kids. I'm supportive of parents meeting with their doctor to determine the best healthcare decisions for their kids on a case-by-case -case basis, which the most common treatment for kids who are suffering from gender dysphoria under the age of 18 is merely socially transitioning. The fact is, is this is only a few thousand kids across the country when there's over half a million kids in foster homes right now who suffer far greater rates of abuse. But I'm always inclined to leave healthcare to the decisions of a, of a patient, a doctor who they consult with, and if they are a parent, the child being the advocate for that parent. And ultimately, a doctor should not be required by government nor insurance company or any kind of mandate to violate their oath or their, uh, or, or their desire to help and heal. Period. I think when you frame it like healthcare, that sort of gives the entire game away, right? This is the same as the argument that a lot of pro-trans activists use you know, talking about it in the form of, you know, you would you rather have a, you know, an alive, you know, a, a dead son or an alive daughter? Basically, the, the implication being that if you disallow a child to transition, then, you know, the mental illness that the child will suffer from could end in suicide. And so, of course, what 
you know, empathetic parent wouldn't make that decision in that case. I think framing it as healthcare sells the detractors, some of whom are operating in very good faith, quite short. I mean, we just had Jesse Single on this podcast. And one point that Jesse makes time and time again is that the best evidence we have about gender transitions for children thus far comes from the CAS review, which was just published in the United Kingdom, which really is pretty damning for a lot of the people on the side of doing this invasive, these types of invasive treatments for children. So like, as far as like, I I could understand wanting to get the state out of it as much as possible, but like, how can you not look at it and sort of see a situation where we are just, you know, (laughs) allowing minor minors are making decisions and parents are making decisions for minors with the help of doctors with the help of an activist class that has spurred this along in a way where we just like don't have longitudinal good high quality studies as to how this affects kids hey i say let those studies take place and they should do so outside of the confines of government let independent organizations do these things but in the meantime you should be allowed to seek the health care you want there's all kinds of medications Guess what? Government said taking ivermectin was bad for you, and many people just decided to do it anyway. They took the choice. They didn't want the government to ban that choice. Same with anything else related to COVID. We didn't want vaccine mandates on us. We didn't have to hold what our treatment has to be. We took care of our own lives. We need to apply that to every area of healthcare. This is exactly why it relates to healthcare, because it is a healthcare issue. This is not an issue that is any different from any other care that a physician, a patient needs. And when they're a minor, their parents are in charge of that. Parents can uh, you know, have that sovereignty because they have unconditional love for their kids. They want to see their kids survive and thrive. They're going to be a better advocate than a board or a bureaucrat. And certainly one size fits all healthcare is not libertarianism. That is not freedom. We need to have the ability for individuals to choose what to do on a case by case basis. And like I said, this is being very overblown considering the most common treatment is social transitioning. These, uh, these cases that are being brought forward to make it seem like every kid who questions their gender is automatically thrown on puberty blockers or on hormone replacement therapy is just not telling the full truth. I recommend that detractors meet with families who have trans kids, as I have all over the country. I met a young I don't, person I don't who drove two fair. hours to see me. I don't think that's fair, right? Like I have, you know, a bunch of trans friends and I have parent friends because I'm also a parent who have had gender questioning children, right? Like to act as if it's like merely a lack of knowledge about this sells short the arguments that people like me are making, which is that I don't think it's freedom either to have a situation where we've very much had this activist class that has been highly successful with influencing a lot of gatekeeper (coughs) medical organizations in the United States to make it seem like the only acceptable way to treat a gender questioning kid is to socially transition them or to get them on puberty blockers. Like, I mean, to me, that's not freedom. To me, that's a very moneyed activist class that has really played a significant role in changing the narrative around this discussion when I don't understand why children in many cases couldn't just wait until they're actual adults and can more fully make decisions for themselves. Because when you're dealing with minors, you are dealing with this challenge of like, well, to what degree should the parent be empowered to make the decisions for the minor versus to what degree does the minor child really need to take some time to actually become a full legal adult before making this choice? So here's the thing. You mentioned the gatekeepers of information and things like this. The best way to get rid of them is to tear down the gatekeepers and not have any. No National Institute of Health or FDA or CDC that's guiding this stuff. Let culture actually decide that. But Free I'm even market talking about- of minds decide that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm even talking and, about the APA and even the fact that like journalists have been instructed by like the Associated Press Style Guide, which is the style manual that all journalists use to use terms like gender affirming care, which again, when we begin to frame these things in certain terms, we're giving the entire argument one side of the argument, we're sort of skewing things in favor of them, right? I, I believe we hear both sides. I believe we hear both sides of the argument quite a bit. And and trust me, those are not government institutions. Any government institution shouldn't be trying to guide one thing one way or another. Let culture, free markets, and free minds do that stuff. And that's where that's going to come from. And you may disagree with how things are done. That's the free marketplace of ideas. And I support that. I support people having their own opinions on these things. I would never, ever try to tell you how to raise your kids. And I don't want to tell other parents how to raise their kids because that's not my job. My job is to reduce the size and scope of government and the abuses that exist. Well, hold, let, let me let me drill. Hold on, Liz. Let me just drill down into what I see as the core of this, maybe disagreements, because I think it's it's really important for libertarians to uh, think about, uh, you know, wh- where they stand on this issue. It's one of the big culture war issues right now. Um, and it's important for parents. It's important for kids. Um, it's, it's important for, for everyone. That's why we did an hour and a half with Jesse Single on this. And what I hear Liz saying 
is that there's been a very one-sided discourse about this and uh, people have been shut down from questioning the guidance, um, you know, call, kind of marginalized or called uh, bigots or transphobes and, and stuff like that. And what I hear Chase saying is that the libertarian position, uh, it, I, I mean, first of all, it sounds like Chase sort of agrees that, you know, free discourse is the is the part of the solution here, but also that um, the you have to decide who ultimately is the decision maker. Is it the state? Is it these bureaucratic boards? Or is it the parents when you're talking about a uh, minor? Um, do you have a disagreement there, Liz, with his proposal that ultimately, given what we know now, the parents need to be the ones working in consultation with their doctors instead of the states, you know, putting these mandates forth? Is well, that, I, I mean, yeah. are you comfortable with the state allowing parents and doctors to decide to follow a child's wishes and to surgically transition, like say they surgically transition an eight-year-old. No, that surgical that transition is for 18 and older. No, I I've always okay. had the position that surgery is for 18 and older. And but I do why, want to say this. Why isn't it a situation speak, where the parent gets to rule? Like why does the state get to intervene in that case? Well, I want to, I just want to speak to that last thing that Zach said, saying that there are people who are saying, well, you're a bigot or you're a hater and that's dividing the question up and that's creating a division. It, the same division happens when people say that parents of trans kids are child abusers, groomers, that they're pedophiles. These kinds of accusations come from the other side of that argument. If we're going to have real open discourse with free, open discourse, transparent information, and actually discussing the issue instead of attacking each other, that has to come from both sides of this issue. There's huge division here. And I'm somebody who is willing to reach my hand out. I will listen to just about anybody. It can be done with respectful discourse without creating, you know, narratives that, well, you believe this way, so you must immediately be this. That is not the way to go about freedom and free discourse. That is just insulting each other. And I would say, if you look at the discourse that's been happening between me and the people who have been commenting, who has been throwing more hatred and division out there? I've been called all kinds of things by people who don't like me. And guess what I haven't been doing? Returning fire, because I know that that is not a way to constructively build a conversation. And when they want and when folks want to have a constructive conversation, I'll be right here waiting to have it. Yeah. So I'm here having that conversation. What is your response to why the state should like, why would the state be the decision maker with regard to surgical transitions after age 18 versus the parent? Like, like why? Because I always parent... have bought. Please. Yeah. Yes, because surgery is 100 percent irreversible procedure and puberty blockers and HRT, while not perfect, have been shown to have uh, be mostly reversible and you can get off of them and surgery just like tattoos and frankly if you're uh, you know I'm against circumcision personally I believe that's also body modification uh, but I would like to see that done uh, for adults if, if at all possible without of course religious exemption for that last thing I mentioned there but everything else should be up to an adult to be making those decisions it's why my uh, 16 year old niece when she was 16 she said she wanted to get a tattoo and they said nope you're not getting that uh, in regards to any other kind of body modification, we've set the standard of adulthood, and it should continue to be the standard for body modification surgery. Well, you've but, heard but it here is, first. That uh, is a situation, the, the, though. The anti-circumcision where... movement, uh, Chase where... Oliver is your man. Um, now, I, I want uh, to... But I do think that that's the... inconsistent, okay. right? Because, like, why should the state prevent that, right? If a parent, if there's a 16-year-old minor child, and the parent and the doctor, like, why is it that we're not using the same logic that we use with puberty blockers or HRT related to surgical transition, like because physical the, removal of a body part is different than taking a medication. It shouldn't be that difficult to see. It's two entirely different kinds of healthcare treatments, and one of them is a far more drastic treatment that should be reserved for adults. But we don't want the state involved in healthcare decisions at all. We want the state involved in healthcare decisions up until age eighteen, like or. I think that's inconsistent. So we have we have an age of adulthood for all kinds of things like tattoos. I don't want I don't want kids getting tattoos. I don't want kids deciding uh, that uh, getting a nose job or getting a boob job or anything like that. I think that can wait until you're 18 year old and you as an adult can determine that for yourselves. That's up to you to do. And I've always had that standard and I always will. You can say it's inconsistent, but surgery is very different than medical treatment via medicine. One thing that this um, comes to what brings to mind is when I was moderating the Texas LP debate, um, you know, of which you were a part, you mentioned something about wanting federal protections for abortion versus allowing states to decide their own abortion policy in a piecemeal state by state fashion. Um, I think, you know, that created a fair amount of controversy, uh, a little bit of shoutiness on the stage from your fellow candidates. 
but take the opportunity to just detail that position a little bit more. Uh, yeah, I believe that body autonomy is really the ultimate thing here and that that is where uh, the issue of abortion lies with me. And so I believe if you're going to have it, uh, the, the issue of body autonomy, if you think of, frankly, if you're pro-life, you think abortion is murder, you would want that to be federally illegal. You would want it illegal in every state. I happen yep. to believe that it's a decision between a woman, her doctor, her faith. And I believe that that protects body autonomy. And if it's an inherent human right, like bodily autonomy is, it needs to be federally protected. You can't piecemeal that in place by place. I know there are disagreements with me on there. But I'm pro-choice on just about everything. And I believe that you should be able to be pro-choice about your reproductive health wherever you live and wherever you grow up. Now, that's your determinant. And the most important governance, more than even state governance or local governance, is your own self-governance and your own decision-making. Yeah. Let me continue to go through the points raised on this tweet. Uh, another one, we'll get to vac mask and vax mandates in a minute, but um, open borders. Um, are you an open borders libertarian? I am a, it depends on how people would classify that. That's a very ambiguous term that many people use. I want the 21st century Ellis Island. I want you to come through a port of entry, declare who you are. And if you're there for peace, you just go right on in, get to work and contribute to the economy. You get a job and that will get 99.9% .9 of the people quickly filed through the process so that they can get to work and contribute to the economy instead of being stuck on welfare or charity programs as they are right now. I was in El Paso. I spoke to a business owner who said, I would love to hire a dozen immigrants to help run my restaurant, but I can't because they don't have any kind of licensure or any kind of legal status. And of course, the Border Patrol can go right into any restaurant they want in El Paso and ask for papers. And so he can't hire them. And now they're stuck living in shelters that are taxpayer funded. You want to end the welfare problem with immigration, allow these people to get to work. They want to work. They want to produce. And if we had an Ellis Island system where you just come right in and declare who you are, that would take care of the most of the problems that we see here. And we could focus law enforcement on the crimes of human trafficking or labor or sexual exploitation. There, the, there's some consternation about your past with uh, your past positions on um, COVID policies. Um, this was a big uh, deal for the Libertarian Party. This is this was a big motivator for the takeover that happened in Reno was kind of improving the messaging around pandemic restrictions. Um, there was a tweet by Tim Poole who said that you were are a pro vaccine mandate candidate. Um, and he's quote tweeting a tweet here that says, give me autonomy and property rights. You mean a business can decide to require workers be vaccinated or limit customers to those with a vaccine. If you expand this, what Tim Pool is quote tweeting, I found it a little mis, well, actually very misleading, um, because your original tweet, you're you're replying to Lori Lightfoot, the uh, former mayor of Chicago, uh, saying Democrats once again showing they're only pro-choice when they want to be. Um, a libertarian will always support your individual bodily autonomy and a business property being able to decide if they require a vaccine or not. Government needs to take a big step step back here. So you are replying to her vaccine pro vaccine mandate tweet. Uh, that's that it's a, it's a very misleading retweet by Tim Pool. Um, and then later, someone is replying to you, kind of saying, "Well." Get, saying, give me a convenience or give me death. And then that's when you make the case that a business, the government shouldn't be able to make a mandate, uh, should not be able to mandate a vaccine, but a business should be able to require a vaccine. Um, do you still stand by that stance as articulated here? I do. I stand by property rights. And if a customer wants to limit their base to less people and possibly lose money and possibly go out of business, well, that's the free market in action. They have the right to do that. You know, if uh, there's pro-vaccine mandate tweets that they can actually find that aren't taken completely out of context. I encourage them to find it. Maybe Tim Pool's hiding underneath his beanie and he needs to take it off on the next podcast and let folks see what that's all about. But the truth is, is uh, I've been against mandates from government, against vaccine or mask mandates from government. I support your right to do whatever you want to do. And I'm not going to shame you for that. This is part of this division and hatred that doesn't build the party. The party is bleeding members. If the COVID messaging was so good, this divisive messaging saying, if you were a mask, you ever took a vaccine, you're just an idiot and you're stupid or whatever. That's what they're putting out there. And guess what? We're bleeding members and donors because people want to make decisions for themselves and not be shamed if they made a decision differently than their neighbor. You can make whatever decision you want in your life. I will never, ever, ever allow the government to make that decision for you. I will fight to my dying to make that choice. But there's a third way here, isn't there? Like, 
from my perspective, from my vantage, and I think Zach shares this with me, uh, yeah, we believe that it's a business owner's right to um, require that. I mean, they're free to discriminate uh, if they so choose in this manner. But I think neither of us finds that to be acceptable, right? Like we, we can believe that something ought to be legal, but we find that to be, or at least I find that to be reprehensible behavior, right? I find the discrimination based off of vaccination status to be a horrifying thing that was done, whether it was imposed from the state or imposed by a, a business owner, because what it essentially creates is a culture in which people who may choose to dissent from the vaccine regime for whatever reason uh, effectively have their options majorly limited or perhaps can't go out to eat with their families because there was a time when we weren't vaccinating young children. And in fact, my child still is not vaccinated. Right. Like, what do you make of that? Of like, we could legally support the right to do this because we support property rights in this manner, but we want to very forcefully, loudly reject a culture where any business owner makes that stupid decision. I encourage people to ha make their decisions be heard. You have the right to to use your voice to voice that opinion. But when we're talking about the legal framework of what the government should be doing, we should be opposing mandates. And that's where but I'm trying to get and, to. But here. we're libertarians of the public eye. So it's both and. It's both. Yes, this but legally ought to be I, allowed. I understand if I could finish, if I could finish. Okay. I understand so, yeah. if I could just finish what I'm saying is yeah. to get against mandates, to end mandates and the control of the government over your health care. It's going to require people who both got vaccinated and didn't get vaccinated. And so we have to have the message, you mean that anybody can come to this message regardless of how they feel individually about mandates at a business or a property. And you let that be known. Use the power of boycott. Use the power of culture to put those people out of business if you want to. And you certainly can do that. There have been people who have been put out of business for horrible behavior before using the power of boycott, using the power of our voices. Never seek to use the government force to do that because if we do that, if we give the government the right to enforce the way certain businesses act with regards to who they can allow in, then you're giving an in. That's the slippery slope to property rights being completely taken away on the end and in the end game. We cannot cede ground, even if we disagree with those property owners do. We have to still support the right to do it. Just like free speech, there are people who say all horns of an abhorrent, terrible things that I disagree with. And I speak out against those people, but I will never ever say that it's the government's right to stop that or to cease that from happening. It's up to the individual yeah. people who are in charge of the publications or that's the free market and free speech. And, and the same thing should apply to property rights. They are absolute. And that is applies even if someone disagrees with what you're doing. And I would recommend, Liz, if there's a place that's not allowing your kids to go because well, they didn't have a vaccine. Point, right now, it's well, a you don't go. Yeah. yeah but, 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 you should you all, we you, also need to be very, uh, I think, clear about what actually happened, which is that it wasn't private businesses imposing vaccine mandates or mask mandates. Uh, largely, it was the state. Um, and it we we can imagine an alternative world where that uh, happened and some businesses did it, but that that's not at all the world that we lived in. This came through the OSHA mandate at the federal level, and then all I lived in LA County at the time. This was all mandated by the state, and so your position, Chase, to be crystal clear, is that that was wrong. Yes, OSHA should have never made that mandate. I was glad people sued and got it uh, smacked down. The state should never have been advising these things because, frankly, when the information comes from the state, there's immediate distrust because the state lies to us all the time. The best way to have gotten information about what happened uh, four years ago was through independent organizations, independent of the state, with clean, transparent information. And we just didn't get that. And that is a damn shame. It caused a lot of harm. Millions of businesses closed. And I know people who lost their businesses because of this. I absolutely oppose government-mandated lockdowns or, or mandates of behavior. It's unconscionable. It harmed our economy. It blew up the debt and deficit from all the CARES Act spending that we had to do to patchwork the fact that all these businesses were closing. Yes, those are terrible things, but I'm not going to personally go around and ask people, did you wear a mask or did you get a vaccine whether I know I can talk to you or have to shame you? That's not the behavior of somebody who wants to build a political movement or, or the idea around property rights. We have to let people we disagree with do things we disagree with. Did you it's also not a recipe. It? I just uh, it's also not a recipe for a free society being able to respond to, let's say, a really bad pandemic does occur uh, in a few years. We would want a society where there's voluntary behavior and that might include businesses acting in certain ways as opposed to the state imposing it. And so this idea that you have some original sin if you ever wore a mask or took a vaccine, oh. 
is, uh, I think, destructive and dangerous. But I'm sorry I cut you off, Liz. What was your well, follow-up question? It is raining, you guys. We actually, uh, it is now pouring down upon us. Uh, oh, we're going to try to find some cover. All, All right, right, we're geez. under a tree now. Under, we're not getting the rain down anymore. Okay. I hope there's Are no uh, lightning. Do you see yeah. right now? Like, I feel like that would be a very warm getup. <laughs> yeah, it, is, uh, it is a little warm right now, but you know okay. what? It's cooling me off now because of the rain. Well, oh, I'm very glad. Um, I wanted to clarify. Do you think that private vaccine requirements were a good idea? Aside from what is legally allowable, do you think that I think it was were... bad business because you... Yeah, I think it was bad business because you lose a lot of great employees. Uh, you know, frankly, mm -hmm. truckers and rail workers across this country were treated as heroes until vaccine mandates came out. And then when they said, I don't want to do that, all of a sudden they were the devil. Uh, I think it's pretty terrible. I worked in logistics and I saw exactly how bad vaccine mandates harmed longshoremen and the ability for us to get our goods moving across the country. Uh, right. it, harmed our, it harmed those businesses. And yeah, it's bad business to do that because you're losing out some great employees who want to live by their principles. And that's bad. And frankly, uh, it's going to cost those businesses money. And it did. Yeah, and you're this... right that there are all these supply chain ripple effects that just, you know, sort of tell people they, they are informative and that we realize how completely interconnected our economy is. Um, and then I think that also kind of, you know, bolsters the case against like imposing tariffs uh, on these things. Right. Like like we've had so many 100%. supply chain disruptions over the course of all of 2020, 2021, 2022 because of the vaccine mandates, because of tariffs, because of issues with supply chains elsewhere. Uh, and it's really kind of crazy how much. Um, you know, people really feel it when they go to the grocery store and they suddenly find that the things that they're used to being able to buy in one of the richest countries in this entire world are no longer available for them. I hope it yeah, helps them absolutely. take it all for granted a little bit less. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't it funny that Joe Biden ran against these tariffs and then four years later, he's actually doubling or tripling down on these tariffs? Uh, he seems to be uh, Trump on steroids with regard to trade policy. And I would think that those who voted against uh, uh, Donald Trump because of his protectionist trade policies don't have a friend in Joe Biden. I'm absolutely a free trade warrior and would tear down all those barriers to free trade, including the domestic regulatory barriers that we have, like the Jones Act that makes Hawaii the highest cost of living state in the country because of basically horrible protectionist policies that didn't years ago, and they don't work now. Um, this issue that we were just wrangling o uh, over with uh, private mandates versus government mandates, it brings to mind uh, another kind of thorny issue that libertarians have had to cope with in recent years, which is the censorship uh, or the suppression of speech on social media, which has been enacted by the by private platforms. But some of the documents that have come out through releases like the Twitter files show some behind the scenes pressure from the federal government. How do you think about that question? Like what what should what would you as a. Oh, did we lose Chase there for a second? OK, I think Chase has dropped out. Uh, hopefully he'll join us again for a minute. Dropped out of the chat, not out of the race. That would be really fast. <laughs> he said he couldn't. Hear. I drove him away. <laughs> OK, we're back. Well, no, Chase, I know you're obviously in politician mode and you're not going to badmouth the Mises caucus types or any sort of right wing, right leaning libertarians, because obviously you want to win their votes. But. I am curious. You've gotten an awful lot of criticism, some of which is very nasty and includes like gross homophobic insults and stuff like that, which is horrible um, from. But you've gotten a lot of criticism from this sort of strain of libertarians, this contingent. Do you think, you know, are the, the criticism that you're a little too woke or a little bit too culturally left on a bunch of issues? Is there any truth to this? Uh, is there something that they're misunderstanding or some sort of like if Dave Smith were on the stream right now? Is there a way you would communicate like, hey, actually, we're really not that far apart. I'm not as sort of woke as you think. Well, you know, I, I can't help what you know my beliefs are. And if there's going to be differences there, I understand they're going to exist. But what I've always said is, you know, I don't try to seek to use the differences that they have to stop working towards common goals. And so uh, I would advise them to maybe think differently, to sit down and talk with me, to maybe understand me a little bit more. And the best thing about it is I've had great conversations with Mises Caucus members at past conventions. Some of the best conversations I've had is when you go out of the lobby and you see that group of people having a cigarette or smoking whatever they want right out in front of the uh, building, out of a little cannabis. Uh, those are the great conversations. Uh, I don't smoke cigarettes. I did years and years and years ago, and luckily the patch got me off. Uh, I do consume cannabis as somebody who uh, uh, believes that adults have the right to do that, but I also do it for pain management. I got hit by a car that was driving 40 miles an hour and ruptured vertebrae in my neck and spine. And so I found the value of medical cannabis as opposed to opiates. 
And you don't consume cannabis like Michael Rectumwald does. So that's actually a story. No, I can, ha- I can handle my stuff. And certainly I would never, ever get and buy before like a hugely important thing like that. Like that was a very, very important press conference I knew to be responsible. Uh, responsible use is part of good drug use. Uh, and that means, yeah, you don't take the gummy right before you go on stage. You do it right before you go to bed and uh, <laughs> watch a movie, eat some Cheetos, whatever you do. But even, so you so even the- non-Mises caucus types, though, and even like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, civil discourse, great, awesome, good. But like, I consider myself a little bit more right-leaning in some ways. Like, I'm Catholic. I am pro-life. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this rankles a lot of libertarians, and rightfully so. Many people at Reason very much disagree with me on these things. Um, in several other ways, you know, I'm not so comfortable with some of the... I think it's probably because I live in New York City, and so a lot of the cultural leftism and wokeness feels so front and center. This is the dominant world culturally that I'm in. So it feels um, very suffocating to me a lot of the time. So, But I do consider myself a little bit more conservative, all things considered, while still being a libertarian. How do you make your pitch to me? Like, What do I misunderstand about how you're approaching these issues? Why should I vote for you? Well... Well, I think my, my pitch is is that I understand that you live a life that's differently than me, and I think that, that my platform and my policies afford for both of us to live our lives in peace and in happiness with one another. I have many friends who are far more conservative than me, who are pro-life, who are, who are Catholics, and who have opinions that are very different from mine, but I still get along with them each day. I still love them, and I love their families. I'm part of their community, and that's the true nature of liberty, is that liberty is going to afford us to have a lot of different people with a lot of different opinions. That's how the best rises to the top is in the free market of ideas. And so I urge you to, to think about the fact that I'm not trying to impose my way of life upon you. I'm trying to allow you to live your life the way you see fit, even if it's very different than my personal decisions. I'm allowing for those personal decisions to be made by you because self-governance is the most important thing. I want you to control your life certainly more than I want to control your life. And I would hope that the, the reverse would be the same. And I hope that right-leaning libertarians or maybe more left-leaning libertarians can come to that conclusion together that, hey, we're not going to always agree, but what we can agree on is the fundamental principles. And that's the most important thing. More important than those divisions is the fundamental principles to have the right to disagree about those other divisions. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I just do wonder, though, whether libertarians have, like, one thing that the Mises Caucus sort of speaks to, but I think in a terrible way because they're just like, edge lords but one thing that they i think seem to have almost tapped into is the fact that there's a lot of people loosely culturally on the right who aren't really keen on donald trump and who wants a different type of foreign policy who have strong anti-war bona fides um but they understand that like some of these people are winnable to the libertarian cause whereas historically the libertarian party has not had nearly as much success currying favor with the left and winning over voters from the left um, but especially like right now we see a very weird fractured democratic party. I mean, do you legitimately think libertarians are going to be, um, most successful when we try to message to both left and right at the same time, or a little bit skewed left versus messaging and trying to win over people leaning to the right? I think about so hey, many I like we- normie traditional religious <laughs> conservatives I know who are not MAGA types, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think there's also a lot of people on the left side of the spectrum that aren't hardcore Joe Biden fans either that want freedom. And the truth is, is I came to the Libertarian Party from the Democratic side of the aisle. I was an anti-war Democrat and marching in the streets to oppose the fascist George W. Bush war machine. And then when I found that that war machine also existed within the Democratic Party, I looked for an anti-war party elsewhere. I got brought into a tent and I'm my, and I was my philosophy of anti-war was connected to the greater philosophy of liberty by a great guy named John Mons, who took time to sit with me and say, if you're anti-war, you should be pro-liberty, and here's why. And so I want to yeah. allow these people to come into our tent to hear our message, and let's connect their anti-war view with the greater picture of liberty. Wherever you come from, whether it's eminent domain on your farmland being taken to put a pipeline uh, you know, that I heard about in South Dakota, where they're taking, uh, what is it, uh, uh, coal ca- or carbon capture pipelines through people's property without their permission. You know, I think if that's your issue, welcome home to Liberty, come here. If it's immigration reform, if it's taxes, if it's COVID lockdown and mandates, if it's the warfare state, whatever your idea, let's get you in the tent and let's connect it with a greater philosophy to build a whole new generation of libertarians from the left, right, and center. It's not left versus right. It's right versus wrong. Liberty is the right path. Authoritarianism is the wrong way to go for freedom and prosperity. That's the message we have to draw on. And we can't just target to one side or the other. If we just target the right side, that's the same side we've always been targeting. Where are we at? Two and three percent. If we don't go out, the vo- the vast group of people, many of whom, the largest who are independents, to stop thinking in binary terms, 
that's how we're going to grow up in the middle and really have a large impact with two-party system. That's the best way to do it forward, and that's the path I'm going to take. And I hope people can see the successes in November. The Libertarian Party at their convention invited Donald Trump to speak, uh, and I was there for that speech. He got booed for much of it. He got some cheers when he uh, pledged to free Ross Ulbricht and potentially appoint a um, uh, a Libertarian to his cabinet. Uh, I want to play just a highlight reel of that speech and then get your reactions to Trump's presence at your convention. My record is libertarian. <laughs> DeRoy Murdoch wrote an article yesterday in which he mentions just some of the things that make me a libertarian without even trying to be one. That's nice. The Libertarian Party should nominate Trump for President of the United States. Whoa. That's nice. Only if you want to win. Only if you want to win. Maybe you don't want to win. Maybe you don't want to win. Keep getting your 3% every four years. Now I think you should nominate me or at least vote for me and we should win together. And if you vote for me on day one, I will commute the sentence of Ross Ulbricht to a sentence of time, sir. Free Ross! Free Ross! Free Ross! Free Ross! Free Ross! That is why I'm committing to you tonight that I will put a libertarian in my cabinet and also libertarians in senior posts. Yeah! So what'd you think of Trump's speech, Chase? Well, you know, I, I thought first, if he wants to appoint a libertarian to his cabinet, he's got to figure out what a libertarian is first, because I don't think he has a really great understanding of it. He's he's told what a libertarian is by other people. Uh, that's how most of Trump does his things. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. And gets a, he's given a script on a teleprompter. He has, you know, a 500 word vocabulary. And he spits out what he thinks the crowd wants to say. I, of course, want to see Rob Ulbricht freed. And if Trump is elected and he does that, I will be the first to say, hey, I was proven wrong about the trustworthiness of Donald Trump when it comes to pardons. But I don't trust the guy as far as I can throw him. And that's the truth. And so if he does it, that's great. But if he puts a libertarian in his cabinet, that would be great, too. But I also just don't trust that. I think that he's doing what he does anytime he gets in front of an audience that is not completely cultishly addicted to him. And he just says what he thinks they want to hear based on what someone else wrote, and uh, and then thinks, oh, I'm the smartest guy in the room for that. He couldn't stand up to a real debate, and if he did, he would have been on the debate stage with me, Robert Kennedy, and any other uh, candidate who was at that Libertarian convention. He would have had all the time in the world to take us on. He could only take on a feeble Joe Biden, if that, but he can't take on the real thinkers in the room who want to have a real discussion and not just lob bombs at each other. And that's the truth. So Donald Trump, I'm glad you came to our convention. You got the libertarian reception you deserve, the policies you had as president for four years. I hope you learned something. And if you didn't, I hope you learned something in November because, yeah, you were upset about 3%. I got 2% in Georgia and knocked your boy Herschel Walker out of the race. And so I will keep being a fly in the ointment of the two-party system, be it Donald Trump or Joe Biden. They're both ridiculous, feeble, octogenarian presidents who don't have an understanding of what real people are going through because one's been politically connected for 50 years and been making the problems we have and the other one was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and doesn't understand what, it like, what it's like to be an actual working person in this country it's time for something different what, what do you think about the um you know you mentioned you're the fly in the ointment for them what what do you think about the party's new approach here of using that fly in the ointment status to try to get concessions or pledges from the other candidates, getting extracting uh, these promises from Trump, trying to get uh, try to influence RFK in a more libertarian direction. Do you think that that is uh, working as a strategy? Uh, we'll have to see if it works in the next election cycle with who gets elected. But I'm going to make a bet that win or lose, the MAGA members of Congress who get elected in November aren't going to be more libertarian. They're not going to follow Trump's lead. They're, they're, they're following his lead right now with the MAGA policy. So if he, he can make his movement more libertarian, 
good on him, but every policy he has is economic protectionism, division, authoritarianism, grift, and violence. And those are not libertarian values. So I urge him to, again, read some books if he wants to, have someone read a book for him and maybe write up a little paper about what it's about, a little book report, and then he can figure out what he is and realize it's not a libertarian. Hmm. Do you feel personally spurned or pissed off that, you know, that you were nominated at the Libertarian Party's convention, and yet at this convention, the Republican frontrunner was given the primetime speaking spot? Yeah, well, it's not so much that I'm spurned for me about that. What really upsets me is that we took time out of our convention to put Duopolis on stage and not other great Libertarian candidates that are running across the country that could have used the delegate and activist energy in that room to fundraise, to get the word out about their campaign, and to really support the party down ballot. And I know Trump brought a lot of attention. And I actually think, and I will be the first to say, I was skeptical about that because I thought there was going to be brand confusion between the Libertarians. But everyone saw us booing out of the room, and the Libertarians right. gave them the exact kind of response that we should have been. So I'm very proud of the Libertarians in the room who didn't just roll over and clap for everything he said because there's a president in the room. And, oh, he's so special because he got elected president. No, I am happy to say that Libertarians gave a Libertarian reception to an authoritarian on our stage. And I don't think, uh, you know, I think authoritarians are going to be a little scared to be around libertarians from now when we put the fear into them. And that's a good thing because when they're scared, they make mistakes. When they make mistakes, we build, we grow, we survive, we thrive. So what is your realistic, uh, what are your realistic goals for the libertarian party in th this year and let's say over the next couple of years? Um, and what are you going to do with this candidacy to help achieve those? Yeah, well, I've already made the promises that it should be fall short of the the giant hill of the climb of winning this office. There's a lot of other victories we can have as libertarians. We can win ballot access in states all over the country so libertarians can run for office. We can win major party status. That gives us access to the primary ballot, increased media attention, and things like being on the Iowa soapbox. I'm the first libertarian candidate for president, the first non-Republican or Democrat candidate for president to ever speak at that huge event, and it's because we earned major party status in Iowa. We can help elect local libertarians across the country to start nullifying bad laws immediately. And of course, we could grow our membership. I'm committed to at least doubling our membership during this campaign. And I'm not leaving the party in November. I'm staying involved. We're going to keep these members connected. We're going to affiliate groups all over the country to grow our party from the ground up. We're going to build our party from the foundation up so we can start actually getting elected in positions to tear the state down. I want to ask really quickly, just before we wrap about a tweet um, that you'd sent in 2022, uh, and you said something along the lines of, here, I'm reading actually verbatim, the National Libertarian Party does not speak for me, and unless I retweet, I do not in at all endorse them. There is no tent big enough for myself, my friends, and family to be alongside racists and bigots. Lou Rockwell and his work is bigoted tripe. I'm a lifetime member, but I ask that my name never be used in advertising or marketing in any way. I'm still a proud libertarian from Georgia. That won't change. Um, I think your name is being used in marketing in the sense that you're now running for president. Could you give me the context for that tweet and explain whether you've done an about face or what that was all about? It was a response made in anger to a tweet that I extremely disagree with. And I don't disagree with how I described uh, that one individual person, not collectivizing everyone. I do have an individual disagree with that person. And it's you're Lou right. I, uh, yes. Now, aside What's from that point, we've also... Uh, I do believe him to be a racist, and I don't like racists. Sorry about it. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. I can't, I can't change my personal opinion based on the things he's done, the things he said, and uh, that's why I'm going to stand there. What specifically? Just because there's I'm still not going to sit here. Tools. I'm not going to sit here and look up individual things right now. I don't have a whole bunch of stuff like for me. What I'm going to say is that you can look into his record yourself. You can look at the fact that he links to the Daily Stormer website from his own website, which is a certifiable Nazi website. So I'm sorry if you're doing that. You're going to have a hard time convincing me. Otherwise, he's welcome to give me a call if he wants to. But uh, I also, later on, oh, I'm sorry, Chase, I muted you. <laughs> Go ahead. Right, you're good. I, uh, yeah, and in the future, I'd actually message the National Party, both my campaign manager and message the National Chairperson and the National Party social media to let them know that this is no longer the case. I just don't delete tweets and scrub them because when you do that, people call you a coward. Uh, <laughs> so I have to keep the record up there for what I said at the time. But I can say right now, I'm happy that, and hopefully they share this message, they can share this campaign. And we can work together to grow the party. I shook chair in Carl's hand right there uh, once she got reelected. I congratulated her on her reelection. I want to work with her to grow the party because I want her next term to be an extremely successful term for her, for me, and for the Libertarian Party altogether. But those people who, like, you know, love Lou Rockwell, 
um, or tolerate Lou Rockwell are still in charge of the party, right? Um, I don't know everybody's opinion on Lou Rockwell. I don't go around asking people, do you like Lou Rockwell or don't you? Can I work but, with you if you like him or don't? So I don't know, honestly. I don't you, know what you under, You understand are. what I'm saying, which is that this tweet was issued less than two years ago. And so you went from being like, remove my name from all relevant materials because of whether the Lou Rockwell, you know, allegiances specifically or some vibe that you're picking up on, which is that, which I agree with, which is that this Mises caucus leadership uses some really vile, racist, anti-Semitic, homophobic, some really nasty stuff, whether it's simply people who are affiliated with the Mises caucus or some of the official messaging. Um, you know, you said two years ago, hey, get my name scrubbed from all of this. And then now your name is going to be next to Libertarian Party on literally every person's ballot, hopefully, God willing, in the entire country. Like, like you're comfortable now, even though those it's not as if there's been this massive sea change where these people from the Mises caucus have been removed from the party? I think if there wasn't a huge dissatisfaction with some of the messaging that's been coming out of the national party, I wouldn't have won the nomination in the room. I think people have always been knowing that I don't like that kind of edgy messaging that frankly doesn't build and isn't constructive. And I urge us to do some uh, different, some soul searching and better ways to market ourselves. That doesn't do mean I hit any individual number. No. Do you think that's going to happen? Like to me, the fact that you were, you emerged from this convention as the presidential nominee but also that Angel McCarnell got reelected, it's a little bit of whiplash. What do you make yeah, of it? Seems to me, yeah, I, I make of it that we have to get to work. We have to find the commonalities of our principles if we both care about this party and growing it. Uh, we have to find the areas of agreement, seek to work together and build ourselves. Otherwise, uh, you know, we're going to be spinning our tires. And I don't think we have time for that with the overly abusive and intrusive state, the $34, $35 trillion debt that we have now. Uh, we have to take the time to understand we're not going to agree on everything, but we have to work together now. I did so as a candidate for Senate. I want to say this. The same day I made that tweet, I went out and I door knocked on over 100 doors for liberty, speaking the message. I had to distance myself from what those tweets were because I had people in my own community in Georgia who were likely voters for me saying, if you can't speak out against racism, then why are you worth my vote? And I had to do it because you know what? That's my convictions. And I urge anybody who can't speak out against racism to recognize that you're not going to get a vote from lots of people if you can't do that. Uh we have one last question for you, Chase, which is the question of the show. What's a question you think more people should be asking? Uh, a question more people should be asking. Why is it that we continue to have 19 or 18 percent approval ratings in Congress, but yet 90 percent of the people get reelected every time? Don't we think the game is pretty screwed up when the, there's such a vast difference of opinion in the work they do and yet they get rehired? Why is it that private business doesn't have this problem? It's because they're responsible to the needs of the people and government isn't. Chase Oliver, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.